All right. So, uh, last time we went through, we tried to make it through all three, omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. We only got through the first two, uh, omnipresence and omniscience. Uh, what I did forget to do last time was uh, to read some of the excerpts, uh, Tozer's uh, commentary on some of these things. And so, um, beginning with omnipresence, he had a couple of neat little things. Tozer says, God is everywhere, here, close to everything, next to everyone. Few other truths are taught in Scripture with as great a clarity as the doctrine of divine omnipresence. Those passages supporting this truth are so plain that it would take considerable effort to misunderstand them. They declare that God is imminent in His creation, that there is no place in heaven or on earth or hell where men may hide from His presence. They teach that God is at once far off and near, and that in Him men move and live and have their being. And what is equally convincing is that everywhere they compel us to assume that God is omnipresent to account for other facts they tell us about Him. Uh, he goes on to say that... Uh, the world is spiritual. It's originated in spirit. It flows out of spirit. It's spiritual in its essence, and it's meaningless apart from the spirit that inhabits it. Um, he also says, The universe operates as an orderly system, not by impersonal laws, but by the creative voice of the imminent and universal presence, the Logos. And so the word of God. Um regarding his omniscience he says to say that god is omniscient is to say that he possesses perfect knowledge and therefore has no need to learn but it is more it is to say that god has never learned and cannot learn and that was a neat spin that i think that he he introduces here uh, to think that god knows everything that's one thing but to think that god can't learn um, because he knows everything. That's just, you know, God has never woken up and went, well, that didn't work. You, you know, I mean, he, he knows everything. Uh, he continues and says, God perfectly knows himself, and being the source and author of all things, it follows that he knows all that can be known. And this he knows instantly with a fullness of perfection that includes every possible item of knowledge concerning everything that exists or could have existed anywhere in the universe at any time in the past or that may exist in the centuries or ages yet unborn. And uh, it goes on to say only the infinite can know the infinite. And so with that, there are things that we're just not going to know about God because only God can know about them. Uh, I did like how he how he notes that God he, God can know anything that could be known, right? And so not only like when we talk about the laws of probability, God knows every outcome that is probable. God knows, like you know, to 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 really kind of dumb it down to my level, if you roll a dice, a six sided die, God knows what number is going to be on top every single time. There is no probability with him. Nothing is left to chance. He knows everything. And I thought that was just great. Um, and so to, to jump in with uh, omnipotence, since I got the book open here, um, he says, Sovereignty and omnipotence must go together. One cannot exist without the other. To reign, God must have power. And to reign sovereignly, he must have all power. And that is what omnipotent means, having all power. Uh, and then he goes on to explain some things. Uh, first, he says, God has delegated power to his creatures, but being self-sufficient, he cannot relinquish anything of his perfections and power being one of them. He gives, but he does not give away. And this is a really good explanation of that. Um, so, so God... Um, God will delegate power, but he cannot relinquish power, meaning he is in charge of every situation. Even when we think that we chose something, he is still sovereignly in charge of that. It doesn't mean that he's making you think it, but it means that he is in control of that. 
Um, he goes on, the uniformity of God's activities in his creation enables the scientists to predict the course of natural phenomena. The trustworthiness of God's behavior in his world is the foundation of all scientific truth. Also like this, the idea that we can trust science because God set it in order. God was the power that set it in order. Now, obviously not all science can we trust because science is done by humanity. And so, you know, sinful fallen man come up with theories. A scientific theory is a little different than something like the law of gravity, though. Like, we never have to worry about gravity being on the fritz because God set that into order. And he can do that because he's all-powerful. And then he says, Omnipotence is not a name given to the sum of all power, but an attribute of a personal God whom we Christians believe to be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and of all who believe him uh, to life eternal. And that's important too. Um, <clears throat> now, for the sake of explanation, when, when I teach my high school class, I, I tell them, like, look, being all-powerful means that God has or could have all the powers. If shooting lasers out your eyes is a power, God could have that. All right. Um, one of the uh, one of the more fun things that stuck was to think that if God is all-powerful and He is also omnipresent, you put these together and you have a scenario in which God has the power, the knowledge, and the ability to fix heat, and eat all the waffles over all of the world for all of time at once. You know, and that's, that's kind of a funny explanation, but if you think about it, that's quite of a big task to create them and eat them at the same time. Not like create them and then eat them, but to create them and eat them. Like to heat them and to put syrup on them all at the same time. Like God has the ability to do that, and not only the ability to do that, but because he is everywhere and every when, he could eat all of them over the entire world over the span of time. So from the creation of the first waffle, he could eat the first waffle and the last. The alpha waffle and omega waffle, God could make and consume all at the same time because he's all powerful and all present. And so uh, that's, just, that's just a neat little thing. Uh, really, it's mind-blowing if you try to think about that. That's silly, but... Like, it's just unfathomable because, like, if I'm going to eat a waffle, like, you got to take it out of the wrapper first, right? Um, like, or, or I've got to mix the batter, and then I've got to heat the iron, and then I've got to, but God can do it all and have it eaten and digested at once. Now, God's not physical, so God's not up in heaven eating waffles, but uh, the idea stands that he could do it because he's all-powerful. So um, we're going to define the idea of omnipotence. Uh, we're going to define it positively and negatively. And that doesn't mean like we're going to talk good about it and then we're going to talk bad about it. All right. But we're going to say what it is and what it isn't. Um, so positively, the definition of omnipotence is that God is able to do whatever he wills to do. God is able to do whatever he wills to do. Um, there's no distinction between what he chooses and what he does. Like, because when he wants it, it is. All right? And so whatever he wills to do, he will accomplish. Um, defined negatively, is the idea that God... Uh, the book's definition is uh, God is perfectly consistent. So God couldn't build a wall so strong that he could knock it down. Is that, that is, you know, like God can do anything. That's the positive definition of it. But like, so is God powerful enough to lie? Well, it's against his character and nature. Like, so... You know, and again, this idea, could God do something so big that even he couldn't fix it? And, and that's, number one, it's not a right thinking because if God did it, it was his will to do it. Like, 
he, he, if God built a wall, it was his will that the wall be there. Why would he knock it down? You know? Um, and so it, it just doesn't... Um, well, so, you know, he's a God of truth, so he does not lie. Hebrews 6, 18 says clearly uh, he does not lie. Um, he's the holy God, so he does not accept evil in his presence. Okay? And so he's not going to do that. Um, he's the mighty God, so evil can't even tempt him. And uh, you look at uh, uh, James 1.13. Um, let no man say when he's tempted. We, we, have to, we have to understand God is not going to go against his character. And so the fact that he is all-powerful does not mean that there is even the remote chance that he would undo or do something outside of who he is. Um, because being all-powerful means doing according to his will, not having every power. Um, and he's faithful and he's loving and he does not disown his children in whom his spirit dwells. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.13 And so when, when we talk about God and his power, we have to be very, very careful to use the word cannot. <laughs> All right? Because it doesn't apply to God. There's nothing he cannot do. Um, and so like he will do according to his character, according to his will. All right, because that's what omnipotence means. Uh, but he, to say that he will not is a matter of his character and who he's re revealed himself to be. To say that he cannot uh, really begins the, the trail to blasphemy, in my opinion. To say God cannot do anything. He's got to, he can do whatever he wants. Um, and so um, anything that sins is not God. All right, and so if you see something that is against the character of God, it's not of God. Uh, God never stops being God. He never changes. All right, we'll see that later in his immutability. Um, but to say, well, what if God changes his mind? He doesn't. There is no shadow of turning in him. And so what he reveals to us is a God that can do according to his will and that's, I think that's the big change, I think, for a lot of people when they go to think about or explain uh, God being all-powerful. And so, yeah, you could say that he has all the powers, and he, he does. If, if he willed to have lasers shoot out of his eyes, he would do that, all right? Um, but it really more means that he can do whatever he wants. And whatever he wants, he does. God doesn't sit there and go, I really want to do this, but I'm going to hold back. Like... It happens because he is God. And so uh, his will and his, and his thoughts are one and the same. And so the world bends to his thought and to his will. We have a couple of statements in Scripture that reveal his omnipotence. Uh, the first one is Revelation 1.8. If you want to turn there. Um, Genesis 17, 1 is another one, and Revelation 19, 6. So Revelation 1, 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Hey, think about that. We, we use that term Almighty, but the term Almighty means having all the power. You know, it's not just a name. It's capitalized when you see it in Scripture, the Almighty. But it's not just a name. It is a term of omnipotence. Uh, since we're in Revelation, let's go ahead and look at 19.6. Revelation 19.6 says, Then I heard something like a voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. And so again, that, that idea, that name, that title of the Almighty means uh, having all might, having all power. Genesis 17.1 was the other. And again, it's this name. 
When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty. All right. Um, it says, live in my presence and be blameless. I am Almighty. This is God saying himself, I am the Almighty. And so God claims to have all of that might, all of that power. Um, there's just a couple of verses here. We're going to kind of... Uh, move through them. Genesis 18, 14 shows us nothing is too difficult for God. Job 42, 2, God can do everything and no one can withhold their thoughts from him. Isaiah 46, 10 and 11 shows us that God does anything he pleases to do. He works even through the decisions and actions of others. Uh, that's reminiscent of Romans 8, 28. God can work all things together for the good of those who call him or love him and are called according to his purposes. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 17. God made the heaven and earth and nothing is too difficult for him. Daniel 4, 35. God does what he wills to do and no one can check his power. He is dependent with no one and nothing. Or excuse me, he is dependent on no one and nothing. Uh, Nahum 1, 5, and 6, nothing can stand against God. And then Luke 1, 37, Jesus says, with man this is impossible, nothing is impossible with God. And so um, we, uh, we know that God has everything at his disposal. Uh, the significance of omnipotence, uh, there are several things that we can, I guess, you know, checks that you can take to the bank, uh, to, so, so to speak. Um, because God is all powerful, because he has all the powers, we can have, dis we can have peace despite things like bad situations, world conflicts, uh, the world can, can be going someplace bad in a handbasket and you can have peace because you know, God is in control. Uh, and again, that, uh, that idea of divine sovereignty and him, uh, delegating authority. It does not mean that God is making the wars happen. It does not mean he, he is making those dictators happen. But it does say in Scripture that God sets in authority the rulers of the earth. And so God can be using those things. And he has the power to do so. And so even when things look bad, we can trust God because he is all, nothing is going to escape him. Nothing's going to overwhelm him. Um. And then we can have peace despite personal problems. Okay, so big things. We can have peace because God is all-powerful. Small things. We can have peace because God is all-powerful. He cares even to us. He knows the number of hairs on our head. Um, God is not unaware because he knows everything. And he's everywhere, so he's with you in the midst of troubles. And we can trust him because he, he knows and sees. He's there. And he has the power to change things. And so if God is allowing us to go through a situation, we have to trust that he has something he wants to do in that situation. Um, and then finally, uh, if God is all-powerful and Jesus comes and he's God with us, and Paul talks about the mystery of Christ in us, for the believer, if we have God within us, then we represent his power in the world. Um, God has given us authority on the earth through the power of his Holy Spirit. Um, not only that, but before, before even salvation, um, in Genesis 1, 27, I believe, God gave man dominion over the earth. And so God delegated that power and trusted uh, mankind with the power to take care of the earth. And so we represent God's power. Um, and so when we find ourselves in a situation in which uh, we may be, you know, we may, it may be a issue with the world. It may be a personal problem. It may be something going on with somebody else. Uh, we are not only witnesses to God's power and testaments of God's power, but God has placed us in situations to, uh, to represent him and his power. And so we pray. When we, when we pray in Jesus' name, he's told us to pray about everything. And so uh, we have the, the power to insert God's authority and name and uh, 
and might into a situation. We don't have the power that belongs to God, but we represent that power. And so um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, The one who called us is faithful, and he will accomplish his will in our lives. And so when God calls you to a situation, know that he has placed you in that situation as his representative, and he can bring you through that situation, not just by the skin of your teeth, but with his will in mind, because that's what he does. He does what he wants. And so uh, his, his will is important. Uh, Philippians 4.13, and this is, this is the one that everybody gets caught up on. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Um, and it's true. You can do all things in Christ if it's his will because he does according to his will. That's what omnipotence means. So he does according to his will. The second you take Jesus' name and step outside of his will, you're going to fall on your face because it's not his will. And so, you know, uh, we get into a lot of tricky situations in which we misrepresent God. And I don't, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but... Um, you know, people from the word faith movement that say, well, you name it and you claim it. You, God has given you the power. He hasn't, he's delegated you to be a minister of his will. And so I don't have any power. Now, if God tells me, go lay hands on that person, then I'm going to go lay hands on that person and I'm going to believe they're going to be healed because it's his will. But I don't go in like a cowboy finger guns down the hallway at the hospital healing people that's that that's not my power and so he has all the power and i'm just a representative of his and so yes we can do all things through christ which strengthens us according to his will according to his will that's that's the big point there uh thoughts comments questions about god's omnipotence about waffles. All right, well, uh, since we didn't get that done the last time, um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, and I think this is, this is supplemental to omnipresence, but I think it's equally important, um, and that is his eternality. All right, so God is an eternal being. And what that means is he is infinite or without limitation, all right? Uh, his existence cannot be limited. So it cannot be limited by space, meaning he is everywhere. It cannot be limited by time, meaning he is every when. And so um, uh, the idea that God is everywhere and every when uh, in, in uh, omnipresence is important, but when you look at eternal, you begin to define the nature of the spirit, and uh, and so, like, there are different kinds of beings, and the eternality of God really translates into us understanding the kinds of beings. Um, there are beings that have a beginning and an end, okay, and so like um, like a, a common chicken. Like it hatches, it's brought forth, it's birthed, and it has an end, typically on somebody's plate. Um, or across the road, depending on what story you like to, you prefer to listen to. Um, but animals, animals are creatures with a definite beginning and a definite end. Uh, there, there, is, there is no biblical support for doggy heaven. You know, and I know people with good intentions tell their kids that, but it is a falsehood. Um, the, the technical word for falsehood is lie. Um, and so as much as you want to uh, shelter your child, you cannot say that there is a doggy heaven or a chicken heaven or a goldfish heaven, right? Um, the best you can do is uh, teach them that, hey, there are different kinds of beings. They're not eternal beings. God created things that are going to be eternal. Um, and so there are things with a beginning and an end. There are things with a beginning but no end, all right? And that is humanity. That is mankind because we are spiritual beings. And so we are created with eternity in mind, but we are created in our finite state. And so uh, there's, there's a day you were born, and you, you were conceived, and, 
and all of that happens, but there is no end once you are conceived because you're an eternal being. And so you have beings with a beginning and an end, and you have a beginning uh, beings with a beginning but no end, and then you have a being with no beginning and no end. The Revelation verse we read earlier, I am the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the beginning and the end. And only God fits this description. There is no other being with no beginning and no end that, that we know or understand or have any idea of. Everything else is created, and so they have to have a beginning. But God is the uncreated one. And so uh, to, to take some uh, simple geometry here, if, if we're looking at this, um, we have what we call a line segment. And that is a defined beginning and a defined end. And then we have any, any math people? Array. Array, yes. And so there is a definite beginning, but there is no end to that. And then you have a line. And to that line, there is no beginning, there is no end. And so when you're explaining these three types of creatures, this is an easy way that you can actually draw out, okay? You've got a line segment, defined beginning, defined end. And this is animals and creatures. You have a defined beginning but no end, and this is mankind. And then no beginning, no end, and that's the nature of God. So uh, we see statements of his eternality throughout Scripture. Uh, Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. Give you a chance to turn there. Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, Then Moses asked God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And this is exactly what uh, Jennifer was talking about the last time when we were looking at God's uh, omnipresence. The, the idea of I am. There is no beginning. There is no end. end he just am. Right? And so uh, I am. Very important. Um, because most people, uh, because of the scientific method, because of the way we process things, you know, they're, they're willing to accept the idea, well, where do we come from? Well, God created us. Where did the world come from? Well, God created the world. The hiccup comes with, well, who created God? Because that's the pattern we see. Because we see finite, you know, and we don't understand the eternal. And so that's some of the reason for differentiating in his eternality and his uh, omnipresence. Uh, Revelation 4 8. We can turn there. Revelation 4 8. It says, each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. All right, so again, who was, who is, and is to come. Uh, a statement of his eternality. And then Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. Go ahead and turn there. I say what I was looking at did not look like Psalm 90. All right, Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. And so this idea of God's eternality is not something we pull out of thin air to explain God, but it's something God says about himself through his word. And there are several pieces of significant information when we look at God's eternality. Several things that we have to consider because if he is 
unending, uncreated, and he's just here forever, then certain qualifications or qualities about God uh, are that way too. God's judgment extends forever. And so if God is going to sit and judge, that means he gets to judge as far back as he wants and far into the future as he wants. And so uh, for the unbeliever who has not been absolved of their sin, the, the unbeliever who has not had their sin covered by the blood of Christ, he's going to go back the entire history. He, like, he is going to go back to the very first little thing that was off in your mind when you chose your way over God's way. And whether you're even conscious of it, because we're born in iniquity, we're conceived in iniquity, like we can't escape this idea of original sin that we see in Romans 5.12, the sin came through Adam. And so because it's Adam sinned, all men are born into sin. All men have sinned, uh, men and women, let's not get exclusionary. But uh, God's judgment extends forever. And so that means generations back, God will judge those people. All right. When we get when we sit at on judgment day and Christ sits on the great white throne of judgment, he will judge everyone from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve will be a participant in that judgment. Think about that. And you know what? If if we pass away and 30 generations live after us. God's judgment will extend to them as well. And so his judgment is eternal. There's no escaping that judgment. But also, God's love and his mercy extend eternally. And so when, when God calls you and you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, his covering goes back as far as you've existed. Think about that. His covering goes as far forward as you will exist. And so because he is an eternal being, not only is his judgment eternal, but his love and his mercy is eternal. And so when you're standing in that love and mercy, all right, that's the good thing. It's going to extend to every aspect. But if you're not, you're standing in that eternal judgment. And then, um, well, let's look, let's look at first current, uh, excuse me, first Thessalonians 4.17. Let's look at that. First Thessalonians four seventeen. Paul says, Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. All right, that love and mercy, his grace that covers us through the blood of Jesus Christ, it equips us to spend our eternal end. You know, we had the, the lines up there. Uh, there is no end for us. And so in Christ, we will be with him forever is what that scripture says. Um, Revelation uh, 21, 1 through 5. Let's look at that. This is uh, getting really close to the end of the book here. Revelation 21. Verses 1 through 5. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. And so... Living eternally in the presence of God, in his love, in his mercy, in his grace, he makes everything new. And he can make everything new because we've got an eternity to spend in the new. Like, you know, it, it extends from that point through eternity. Now, here's, here's the problem with the finite human mind. Um, we like to think of the idea of infinity, right? And so when we think eternity, we think all of time. That's, that's what we think. 
or we think forever and ever and ever and ever. Here's the problem. Time and space exist in this little bubble. Eternity is not a period of time, but it is a state of being in which the God of the universe dwells. All right, so let's just create a little world around this. So we've got this idea of space and time, but God exists outside of space and time in eternity. And so to say that, e that eternity is all the years is wrong <laughs> because a year is a finite measurement and you cannot measure eternity because eternity exists outside of the system in which we've created our measurements. And so to reign with him in eternity, to be with him for eternity in this idea outside of space and time means that we are going to exist as God exists. Now, the only way we can do this is because he said, let us create man in our own image, right? And we became spiritual beings. His breath breathed into mankind. We became spiritual beings. At that moment, before, and I'll just put this to you, I think before the Spirit of God entered the man, the man was a line segment being, right? And it was a def definite beginning and a definite end. Man was a line segment being just like the animals when, when God created him out of the dust of the earth. But the second the breath of God, the pneuma breath of God entered into man, he became a spiritual being and he became an eternal being. And it's important for us to understand that we're going to spend eternity somewhere. And you've probably heard that in the gospel presentation before. You know, you get, you get to choose whether you spend it in, in hell or in heaven. Uh, ultimately, God... God is the one that makes that judgment call because it's his to make. Um, and so it's not just a, yeah, I'd rather not burn for eternity. Give me that ticket, please. Uh, that's, you know, there's, there are things that are qualified there that are important. Um, but because we are uh, eternal beings, we must live in light of eternity. And so the decisions we make, the things that we do, the things that we value should be those things of eternal beings. And so, you know, the, the old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wondrous face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Um, you know, this idea of things becoming less important when you understand who you are. And so I think a lot of people, if they would get an understanding of look, I'm an eternal being and I'm going to spend an eternity someplace, I, there may be some things that should be more important to me. When I think other people are eternal beings, I should be concerned where that eternity goes for them. I should be concerned with their eternity if I'm an eternal being. But, you know, no, I, you've got to make a buck. You, you've, got to, you've got to do these things. You, well, you know, my... My recliner's pretty comfortable. I mean, all of the small temporary things uh, that, that we could focus on when we understand that we're eternal beings and that we should live as eternal beings live, uh, things change for us. Um, you know, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says God's put eternity in the hearts of man. And I think it's one of the most beautiful expressions of that. And now we know that because God exists outside of space and time, our hearts are in space and time. This is like inviting Jesus into your heart. He was a full-grown man. I don't think he's going to fit, right? Um, and so God placing eternity in the hearts, it does, it's not some weird metaphysical thing where you've got eternity in your heart. That, like it would block the blood flow if you had eternity in your heart. Um, but this idea that God has created man as eternal beings is so important. Um, and so we can read things like uh, John 6, 35. Let's turn there. John 6, 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Now think about that. Like, 
If someone were to grab a hold of this technology, we could solve world hunger. That's not what it's about. This is an eternal hunger, an eternal thirst that he's talking about. He's not talking about unending bread. All right. God's not giving to everybody never ending soup and salad at Olive Garden. All right. But he is saying, look, there is something substantial in understanding that you're an eternal being, that you have an eternal hunger, that things of this world cannot satisfy. You have an eternal thirst that things of this world cannot satisfy. And so, as eternal beings, Jesus is the only thing that will fill those eternal needs. And that's what he's saying there. And when we start to look at those things throughout Scripture, the the needs, the cares that we get caught up in, uh, we we really do well to reevaluate our eternal valuation on the things of the world. Uh, you know, it's it's hard. It is, but I think that truly, if we if we took ourselves seriously as eternal beings, some of the temporary things of the world, and that's you know, again, that's why um, a lifelong a uh, bout with cancer can be a light and momentary affliction in light of eternity. You know, a, a, a you, know, you know, God sent his people into 400 years of slavery and was like, it's just a season. You, you know, think about it, 70 years in Babylon. Hey, I'm doing something here. You know, uh, our perspective changes quite a bit on what God is doing and what he wants to do when we remind ourselves that we're eternal beings and that God is an eternal being. And so he's not looking at this little timeline. God's not going, well, yeah, here and here and here and here. God sees the whole thing because he's omnipresent, right? He's omniscient. He knows what's going to happen or what would happen, all right? And so, you know, for for the uh, for the nerds, if, if there was ever a, a reality to any kind of like split timelines, you know, you make the, the butterfly effect kind of thing, God knows what would happen. And so it's not a surprise. And he's not worried about it because he's omnipotent. And all of those wrapped in, when you take the eternality of God, not created, not ending, means that he's not concerned with the end of the world. Like, eternal beings aren't concerned with the end of the world. They're, con they're concerned with eternity. And so God says, look, I'm, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. Um, you let me worry about the God stuff, and you act like, an eternal being. You act like eternity matters. All right, so we made it through that. Any thoughts, comments, questions on God's eternality? Yep. If he's eternal, but why would he say I'm the beginning and the end? Because he's speaking to mankind. He, he's speaking to finite man. He's speaking to beings with a beginning. Like, so when he says, I am the beginning, the earliest record we have is what he gave to Moses with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. The Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep. Like, he's saying, I am the beginning. Like, anything, like, and so you could take that moment, or you could take the moment where someone is born. You could take the moment where a, a movement starts. Anything that we had could historically, or from a time perspective, say is the beginning of something, he says, I am that. I'm eternal. That's like, I'm here. And all of your beginnings exist here in this space. And so you can try to fathom all of time, but I am. You know, so, I mean, that's that's the thing. God condescends. Every bit of this, again, I, I'm fully convinced that if God ever revealed in our finite minds the truth uh, the, or the wholeness of the truth of who he is and how he is, I mean, I, our little brains would explode, you know. And so for God to say, I'm the beginning and the end, mankind only knows beginning and end. In space and time, we only know birth and death and, and the stuff that happens in between. And so when God goes, look, I got that covered, you know, he is saying, you can trust me. I'm sovereign over this. I'm in control over this. Um, and And literally for us, he was at the beginning. He'll be at the end. And his eternality, really, in the only difference in that and his omnipresence is that these ends that we see go on forever, and he existed there, too. So, Anything else?
All right, well, this is good stuff. I um, believe next session, yes, his immutability. And that's an important one for us. I'm, I'm not going to try to rush into that and, and knock it out, even though we've got a little time. Um, I'd like to give that its own thing because uh, it's really impossible for us to fathom something that doesn't change because we change. We change our minds. We change everything. And, um, and we desperately want things to change, even God sometimes. We want God to change sometimes. And so, spoiler alert, he doesn't. Um, and that's what we'll look at next week. Now, let's close with a word of prayer. God, thank you um, that you are all powerful, that you have all the powers, that you do as you please. Uh, God, thank you that the universe and that eternity is in the hands of a God who is in control, who is able, who is capable. And so, God, I pray that you would just uh, bring us into line with your will. Uh, God, so that our expectations are what you want. Uh, bring our desires in line with your will so that we want what you want. Lord, I pray that you would just be glorified in, in, uh, in what we attribute to you. God, we thank you that you are all knowing and that you're everywhere and when and that you're all powerful. And God, that you exist outside of the finite system we have for understanding life. God, that you have no beginning and end, uh, that you are our beginning and you are, are our end. God, I pray that you would just uh, help us to reflect that. In, in what we value and in, in what we spend our time and, and energy on, God. And I pray that you would just continue to bless us as we go through this study, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.